Good evening. Welcome to the City of Murfreesboro Planning Commission. It's June the 5th. Uh, first order of business is the termination of a quorum. Uh, we do have a quorum tonight. Second item is to approve the minutes of the May 15th Planning Commission meeting. Uh, staff, do you have any corrections or additions to that? No, sir. If not, Vice Chairman, I move that we approve the minutes as submitted. <coughs> okay, have a motion. Second. And a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The, the minutes are approved. First item of business is old business. It's the zoning application for approximately 89.75 acres along Memorial Boulevard to be rezoned from RS-15 to CH. Mr. Brick Murphy, the <coughs> applicant. I would like to remind the audience that this is not a public hearing tonight. We have had a public hearing. There will be another opportunity at city council level to speak on this matter. We're going to hear from the engineers and the applicants on changes they made, have made at the direction of the uh, staff and the planning commission and the community. Ms. Tatelot. Yes, sir. Uh, just sort of as a recap of where we've been and, and where we are. During its regular meeting on May 1st, the Planning Commission did conduct this public hearing on this uh, application. There were quite a number of people uh, present that participated. There's a lot of questions about drainage, uh, traffic, conditions of Hain Drive, Haines Drive, and the need for some improvement. After the public hearing, the Planning Commission deferred action and wanted to have some more information on the drainage and the uh, traffic, et cetera. On May 15th, the Planning Commission met in its regular session. Uh, among the um, items on that agenda was the staff reports and a presentation from Mr. Bill Huddleston, who is the engineer the city has retained to prepare a drainage uh, uh, program, a drainage study, if you will, uh, for the uh, North Murfreesboro area. And, and he reported to you on that study, its status, and also the next part of his program, which was to design a drainage uh, structures and uh, detention areas that would uh, help to drain the area that consistently pulls water uh, north of Haines Drive, west of uh, Memorial Boulevard, on a big part of the property that's uh, subject to this application. Uh, it was a presentation that staff uh, joined in. We uh, also made explanations. We discussed that this is a project that we have been working towards uh, independent of a zone application for this area that this is uh, water that has uh, what we would consider a nuisance uh, to the uh, uh, property owners in the area, uh, the residences uh, with water in their backyards for <coughs> extended periods, and the mosquito problems that that, that type of water has. We uh, discussed uh, the ability to move that project forward uh, using the uh, stormwater funding. That's a, a source of funding that is very well suited for doing that kind of project. Uh, we heard how that project would help to set in the stage for additional improvements. While that project would help to alleviate the uh, level of water, that any development would lower than likely be required to uh, construct additional drainage ditches, drainage pipes, to further drain the property for development purposes. But that the city's ditch would be more of an infrastructure, analogous but not exactly like the big ditch project, where the city stepped in and constructed the improvements that other people could drain to as they develop their property, but would provide immediate relief to existing residences. The uh, um, materials that you have before you uh, include a, a letter from Mr. Brick Murphy with exhibits prepared by uh, his uh, uh, part of his team. Uh, one of the things that had been discussed was to work with the adjacent property owners to uh, talk about uh, the what they call the notch area. That's the uh, portion of one of the tracks that extends uh, into the uh, Palmer Heights subdivision, where those lots that adjacent to it have a uh, very shallow backyards. Uh, one of the areas of uh, trying to uh, accommodate these property owners would be to simply leave that property zone to RS-15 in, in what they call the notch, because uh, it appears that with some amount of study on the part of the applicant's uh, team, it appears that that area can be used very well as a detention area. And that from a land use standpoint, that type of structure can be constructed, whether it's RS-15 or commercial highway. So that area could be left out. There is a map that shows that area, and I think it shows the area as a uh, yellow <coughs> area. Uh, the second uh, area that they've uh, tried to do is to look for a way to um, create a transition of uses, recognizing that some of the uh, commercial highway uses are a little bit more impactful, potentially, to uh, residential uses. 
and so back off to a commercial fringe for a 250 foot strip uh, along the west line of the entire uh, area represented by the original applicants. Uh, that does not include the other property owners, but it just as well could if that were what the Planning Commission were to, to want to recommend. Uh, they have also discussed with, and I think they are willing to commit to, uh, the applicants, and this would be independent, something they would do with recovenants, uh, additional buffering in widths and, and planning heights. I think that's something that they've discussed with the residents. Uh, most of these have been on the, either on one-on-one -on -one meetings or with a couple of uh, property owners at a time as they've been able to, to meet with them. Uh, included with your agenda materials is also an illustration that shows the breakdown from the original request property owners that are shown in orange, and then there is the additional study here that's blue. You'll notice that some of the blue, uh, one of the parcels is owned by the, Mr. and Ms. Parker, uh, just north of, of Haynes Drive, and then the remaining property that would include uh, Mr. Rogers, his wife, uh, Mr. and Ms. Breeding, uh, the Patton's family, and, and a couple other parcels. Uh, since the uh, public hearing, I have received correspondence from Mr. Uh, Breeding and his wife, Ms. Alsa, uh, requesting that their parcels be excluded. They're not uh, against the rezoning. Their circumstances cause them to not be ready for the zoning change and uh, prefer that they uh, keep it zoned residential. But they have uh, alerted me that in the future, as their circumstances change, they may, they may have a desire to, to be rezoned. On the third of the three maps, you'll see their property is identified with a hatch mark area. And you can see it on the screen. It's, a, it's almost the, the north end of it. Uh, for your convenience, to help you to understand the difference between commercial highway and commercial fringe, I include an excerpt from the city's zoning ordinance so that you can see the different uses that are permitted uh, for yourself if you have any questions there. Uh, at this point, the uh, plan staff is here. We're, we're ready to answer your questions. The uh, Planning Commission needs to deliberate this. <coughs> Certainly the applicant's team is, is present to, to maybe uh, uh, answer additional questions. Uh, and if you want to hear them to discuss their letter that this is before you, they're, they're here to make that and would be, be very pleased to do so. Uh, as you say, this is not a public hearing, so we would we really not really ask that they, we would sort of ask that they not, um, uh, I guess, uh, ask that, as much that you uh, approve it as they are to be more of a factual report, which is probably the most appropriate since we've already had a public hearing. <coughs> There has been some significant changes in the original application to what they've come up with now, and they're highlighted in the in this letter. I would like maybe Mr. Murphy to explain some of the the changes that you have made and the accommodations that the property owners have made, and I think that's important. <coughs> Good evening, uh, Vice Chairman uh, Young. I'm Brick Murphy of the law firm of Murphy & Murphy, and we represent the applicants. Um, at the public he hearing, as mentioned, we heard a number of concerns. Uh, based on those concerns, uh, me and my team reached out to a number of the property owners who have been affected, um, particularly the Notch property owners in particular. I had several meetings with them. Um, I fielded a number of phone calls and emails as well, and based on um, those concerns, we had some fact-finding uh, sort of uh, meetings. Uh, we sat down, wanted to get additional information about their concerns to make sure we truly understood um, their concerns as, as, uh, as the property owner's uh, representatives. Um, in response to these neighbors' concerns, we've amended our application as before you tonight. Um, and um, if you would like, Mr. Uh, Randy Caldwell can kind of go through the specifics of that application and the amendment to the application. But basically, the, uh, the points uh, that, are, that are most relevant is the Notch property will stay RS-15. Um, we anticipate having a drainage structure there, either a retention or detention pond in that area. And then 250 feet from the property line adjoining Palmer Heights, um, we'll have commercial fringe, which we feel like is a, a less impactful use. Um, it would not allow things like drive-in banks or uh, drive-in fast food restaurants like a, um, uh, like a McDonald's that has your traditional, I, I would like to say, squat boxes, um, which are a little bit um, uh, you know, obtrusive to the neighbors. So we've um, 
had a transitional zoning um, to soften uh, the application as it interacts with the neighbors based on their concerns expressed to us. Um, we've also uh, widened the buffering um, area from the required 15 feet to, to 20 feet of uh, landscape buffer. Um, the evergreen plantings will be increased from the required six feet to eight feet. So right off the bat, when the project is developed, you'll have an additional two feet of um, evergreen plantings. We feel like that will soften the transition from the residential to the commercial fringe. Um, additionally, uh, we anticipate having at least a 20 foot wide uh, uh, drainage feature, uh, a swell, so you're going to have 40 feet of separation there. So you'll have both buffering uh, evergreen plantings, and you'll have distance, which is one of your best, um, which is one of your best uh, ways to buffer property is distance. Um, we also have proposed these weren't really requested by the neighbors, but we think um, in in being uh, responsible uh, uh, applicants and the property owners just being responsible citizens, we're going to put restrictive covenants prohibiting uses that we feel like are not compatible with the neighborhood um, between, and they'll be recorded between the second and third reading. So these accommodations were based directly on the comments that we heard at the, um, at the, the public hearing that was conducted last month, and then based on our one-on-one -on -one and small group meetings we had with um, the affected parties. And our goal in those meetings, once again, was to truly understand their concerns and, and see if there were ways that we could accommodate those concerns. And I believe our amendment to the application um, does that. So I would thank you for your consideration. Any questions from Mr. Talbert? Ms. Murphy, I have one question for you. Yes. Um, when we speak of the 250-foot um, wide um, commercial fringe, yes, sir. does uh, that is, you know, around the Palmer Heights or the other neighbors. D is that in addition to the buffering and easements, or would that those buffering and easements be part of the 250 feet? Well, the the idea is there there would be the drainage feature, uh, the buffering, and then you'd have the um, commercial fringe would be all part of the same area. Now, in the notch area, you're going to have residential. Um, period. And so you will have buffering there, and um, it, you know, we're going to commit to that buffering density in that uh, residential uh, RS-15 area as well. Um, but that's, that's where we feel like the interface between the neighbors is most sensitive, is in that notch property, because our backyards are smaller. And so you'd have the RS-15 in the notch, and then you'd have um, the additional 250 feet of commercial fringe. Okay. So you're in the notch area. You're getting quite a, a bit of additional space of what we would feel like are, are less impactful type uses. I hope that's um, instructive. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. And Mr. Murphy, you and I had spoken about this briefly earlier. But um, in addition to having the restricted covenants ready to record between second and third readings, you'll have them at least in bullet point format for the council to review uh, when it comes to if this project comes before the council. I'll be prepared to, during our presentation at council, propose um, some just basic bullet points of the sorts of uses that we uh, believe um, should not be on the property. And then some other um, uh, restrictive covenants dealing with things like some building material issues and lighting and some things like that that we feel like can soften the impact of um, any potential development to the neighbor. So that's something we're committed to do. And part of our presentation at council will include those. Now, I, I know that's something that you can't require, but I think that's instructive to the neighbors in terms of what we're willing to do as the applicant's representatives and the applicants are willing to do just as a, a show of good faith. And those are things that we can say for certain we're not going to do these things. And for certain, we are going to do these things. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. I have a question just from Stradlock, probably, I think. Um, Regarding some of these items that are being offered, um, for example, eight foot tall buffer as opposed to a six foot tall buffer, when, when you have something that is above and beyond the standard uh, zoning requirement or buffering requirement, 
how do you enforce that as far as, I mean, this is going to be, if, if you know, any, any rezoning on here is going to go through as any, as a standard rezoning straight out of the book. So does just, you just know and any, and, and people have to come to the planning department to realize that, or if they're just looking up our standard requirements, they're only going to find the six foot, they're not going to know the eight foot until they come in and talk to you on all of these different little items. If it's not in the zoning, it's not something we're involved in, if they're restrictive covenants. Uh, of course, restrictive covenants will be recorded at the registrar's office. And I don't and any, think these are going to be restrictive covenants. This is just what well, they're offering. I was understanding that they were, we're going to make those restrictive covenants. If, if, if it wasn't a commercial fringe. Okay, then I'm, I just read this. I only read the items. last one as being a restrictive covenant. Uh, well, the, the, I know one thing is that I have no ability to enforce anything beyond the minimum requirements of the zone. Do okay. not have not and never never will have that ability, Mr. Murphy. Mr. Mr. Murphy and I traded phone calls for the last two days and didn't get to talk, so I'm so sorry. If you can just clarify for me whether there'll be restrictions on each of these items, M Mrs. Jones, I'm sorry, and uh, you're a very busy person. I'm sorry that you uh, too, you too. Uh, but anything that's above and beyond the base restrictions, we will put uh, the base requirements for the zoning. We'll put down as restrictive covenants, so that okay. way they'll run with the land. They'll be enforceable. Uh, there'll be something that affects the title to the property, and um, they truly do have teeth because they're the things that banks will look at and require as part of uh, financing the property. Okay. So okay. anything that's, that's right. above and beyond your base requirements, we will put in the form mm -hmm. of restrictive covenants recorded before between the second and third reading, and we'll put those in bullet point format and present those uh, at council level. Thank you. Appreciate it. That's my main question. Any other questions? I have one question. Ms. Daylot, one of the first things that we wanted to do with this, whether the zoning is passed or not, is to remove the water from the back ends of the, of the houses along Morgan Road and in Palmer Heights. Uh, with the inclusion of, of the several different property owners, this is, this is now possibility and, and I want to say an assurity. Is, is that a correct statement? Well, n n no, it's not. Uh, but it is a, um, it's, it's very positive to the program. The uh, property owners have indicated a willingness to, uh, and, and they've repeatedly made this public representation that they'll give us whatever easements we need if it's generally as it's been described to them along their rear property lines. Uh, and that's the applicants. But there are other property owners that will have to be considered as well that are not part of that um, application or the property project. Also, the city council will have to approve the funding for it. Uh, so there are some um, steps along the way that have yet to be met. We've got to um, make sure that the uh, council is willing to fund the project, and the, then we'll have to acquire the right-of-way and easements necessary that are beyond the scope of these, these property owners to, to provide. Uh, I do fully intend to, as, that if this moves forward, to make sure that these property owners do give us easements. I have every belief that they will. <clears throat> but we can't make that a condition of their zoning. That's, uh, that's, that would be contract zoning, conditional zoning. It, it won't fly in Tennessee. But I do think they have a reason beyond just the zoning, and that is the development of the property. In the event the, the project's never done, they're going to be on their own to struggle with a way to solve the drainage. And... So they have a big reason for the city to, to be working on it. Uh, we, uh, Mr. House, I think we've set aside some funding for the project at this point, in a, or, or more programmed it into our capital planning. That's correct, uh, Mr. Adelot. The uh, draft <coughs> stormwater capital improvements plan that went before the Water and Sewer Board in the month <coughs> of May uh, included uh, projected funding for this project. Um, and that also included design, construction, and, and property acquisition fees uh, because obviously at the time we were working on that plan, we weren't aware of, of the availability of the donation of any easements. So I assumed there was, would be the purchase of easements and right away uh, in that funding. Um, that capital improvements plan will be presented or has been presented, I think, already in some of the budget information to the uh, Mayor and Council, uh, and, and will be considered in the next few days in your regular budgeting process. The mechanism to get this done is available. 
That's right, and, and we've, we've, we've staff is um, supportive of the project, and, and I think we've got a, 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 a desire to see it done. Uh, independent of the rezoning, we have a desire to see it done, uh, partly to, to relieve some of the uh, drainage conditions we know uh, plague the neighborhood, uh, partly to help us address some public drainage that's already contributing to that problem. And then uh, it's also uh, good planning, we think, because uh, we, we do believe that something will develop on these properties at some point in the future, and they'll need a good drainage system to be, to be a part of their plan. Can I ask one more question regarding the drainage, since we're, we're kind of getting off on that, and, and I realize it's not a, dependent on the zoning, but um, I've had a lot of people ask me, and so I just want to uh, ha have someone else tell them besides me, um, they're concerned that uh, any all this drainage that we're talking about moving over, and I think ultimately it ends up in Hooper Bottom. And uh, since I guess I'm over that way, a lot of people have asked about that and concerned that uh, we're taking a problem from one group and giving it to another. And, and I have uh, told them repeatedly that that is not true. We would not take one problem from one group and just dump it on another to take care of this problem. Um, but I think I'd like someone else that has a whole lot more uh, knowledge about it than me to say that. Well, I think that you'll find that myself, our Mr. Sam Huddleston, our city engineer, uh, our consultant, Mr. Huddleston, will all tell you the same, and that is that we have no intention and our project that we're contemplating will not simply shift the problem from one group of property owners to another. Uh, we will also tell you that currently water from this area does overtop and drain into the Hooper Bottom in extreme events. Uh, part of the project will be to relocate the water it, detention elements, uh, also to clean the water. Part of the problem with the water that goes into the Hooper Bottom is it's dirty water. Uh, you can see it by the trash that we have reports coming in. You can see it sometimes uh, along uh, Seagull Road. Part of our objective will be to put in a, a regime to clean the water to remove trash. Uh, so we do not intend, nor do we believe, that we would simply move the water from one area to another at the expense of the receiving property. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Huff, uh, <coughs> beyond the Hooper Bottom on Thompson Lane, in that uh, another area that water will be able to go under Thompson Lane and into an open field? Well, the, the, we consider all that part of the Hooper Bottom high water area. Uh, the Hooper family owns uh, a, a large portion of the, of the area that's, that ponds now uh, in Hooper's Bottom. Uh, and we've used, we use that name, we've used it for years, but it actually, uh, for our use of it, it includes all of the areas that are below that certain uh, management uh, elevation uh, that, that we managed to in Hooper's Bottom. So both sides, north side of Thompson Lane in the curve and south side of Thompson Lane uh, in the Seagull High School, Seagull Road area, all of those are part of what we call the Hooper Bottom uh, high water area. I keep thinking things. Sorry, Chairman. Um, and, and just the, the 250 feet for commercial fringe that they're uh, suggesting on here, I take it that is a, a reasonable amount for commercial fringe developments, that 250 feet is, is wide enough for something to develop there. Yes, ma'am, it is. But I'd, I'd like to point out that it's possible that it could be part of the same development. And uses that would violate the commercial fringe would not be restricted from that area. So it may be on the same lot of record, but uh, the things that are prohibited by commercial fringe would not be allowed in that area, like the, the drive through windows, mm -hmm. uh, the auto repair, the, the things that we, we know are nuisance when it's located in close proximity to, to single family residences. Mm -hmm. Noise maker. Could, could the back of a 
building that has semi trucks that back up to it you know that could that could go over into that area because it would basically be parking lot and the back of a building well that could happen in the commercial fringe as well the department of discount stores which would have loading areas uh -huh. they can be located in the commercial fringe district too um, however that's those kind of things deserve and merit more buffering than than something like a retail parking lot mm -hmm. uh, where the or a, or a dentist parking lot where it's a, uh, a regular daytime office use, uh, where it's automobiles and a, 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 a small berm with some landscape on it would probably be a very good buffer, whereas a, um, a loading area, uh, well, it requires more distance. It would require probably a larger type berm to be effective and, and more landscaping. So um, I guess to answer your question is it won't necessarily stop some of the uh, uses from being on the same lots, but we keep them out of those areas. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you're okay with the little jog across there that kind of matches the rear property line as opposed to having a straight line between commercial fringe and commercial highway? Frankly, it, it, it really doesn't matter. It's not I, a very big jog. I was going to say, it's probably so big. I mean, in reality, <laughs> nobody will ever even notice it. I mean, you know, it's such a large tract. So We're, we're probably looking at less than 50 Just foot. Just to make sure, right yeah. One, one of the questions I think you should deliberate, if you're leaning in that direction, you may want to consider whether you would like to see it extended into any of the property to the north, the Rogers property, or any of that. Uh, if you were looking at contemplating the idea of uh, accepting the applicant's proposed amendment, that if there's going to be a commercial fringe uh, transitional uh, zoning uh, approach, would we do that to the area further to the north? And, and Ms. Ely, you might see if you can't put one of the uh, maps that shows the blue area and the orange area. On, on to the it's television. The cable department. <coughs> there you go. And, and, and I'm talking about into that blue area uh, to the north. Mm -hmm. Just take the 250 foot buffer and extend it straight on that back property line. Yeah, you, and, 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 and I, will, I will also point out they've offered and, and asked to amend their application to allow the 250 foot instead. You may think that a greater distance may be more appropriate. There's nothing that would prevent you from recommending something different to the city council. Mr. Adelot, though, how can, um, if these are restricted covenants, how can we um, uh, go beyond the, the zoning or requirements on the additional study area? Zoning is not the restrictive government piece mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. Uh, answer. And but, but, commercial fringe is less intensive than commercial highway, so we'd be appro approving something that is less intensive um, than what's requested, okay. if that's you, right. that correct. I Mr. 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 Gilly was real quick to, to, to answer you correctly. Yeah, I understand. Uh, first of all, let, let, me, let, me, let me offer you this. When it comes to restrictive covenants, don't make that a consideration in your vote in the sense that we, the city, will have anything to do with enforcement. As a gesture of goodwill on the, on the part of the applicants, I think it's very nice. I think it's very, very uh, worthy of them. But the city will have no role in enforcing that. Restrictive covenants are, are powerful. I, I, I see it every day. And, and it's not uncommon if I suspect someone's fixing to try to violate them, I'll, I'll let somebody know about it. And it, it usually shapes things up. But I don't have any real enforcement authority, nor do I. I, I really want it. But when it comes to the zoning, we do. Yeah, and I, we'll I, have a lot I'm of levels. Sorry, I, I do understand. Any other questions, comments? Well, I, I do think that the 250 versus whether it's a different amount or not would go back to whether, you, you know, I, I, again, I have no idea whether 250 is the right amount or not. Um, I, I would need to take, you know, that suggestion more from you if you felt 300 feet was more appropriate for that, for a commercial fringe area to, to be of any benefit or, you know, and then if you go on up and, and into the blue area, it, it narrows as you go up there. You know, if you increase that, you're decreasing, you know, you're, it, it's affecting up there on that end a lot more. Ms. Young, I'm going to think about it on a couple of different layers of uh, Ms. Jones. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Ms. Jones, I, yeah. I'm going to think on a couple of different levels. One, one level is administration. Keep it simple. 
a straight line, uh, a consistent distance is very easy to administer. Um, precisely what uh, distance is most appropriate? Really, that is a, a question of, of judgment. I can I can uh, argue or um, well I can analyze it many different ways. Uh, what I want to see is a, a, a meaningful strip, a meaningful transition. 250 foot is a meaningful transition. Uh, I think that uh, Mr. Um, uh, Murphy's <coughs> remarks that one of the best buffers is distance. If you can keep the, the type of uses that will be uh, uh, more likely to be a nuisance a little bit further away, then, then, then that's what buffering should do. One, one of the things that I think that we're going to be working on over the next um, couple of years is, is, is and, I'm, and I'm sensing this mood among the Council and Planning Commission and among the public, that we need to figure out better ways to transition and buffer the, the uses. When we adopted our ordinance in 1984, we didn't really put much buffering. A five-foot landscape strip was all we, we made provisions for. In the late 90s, we, we, in the early 2000s, we adopted our current uh, program with the type A, type B, type C, type D buffer that made accommodations for different widths, different thicknesses of plantings, depending upon whether you be society, the RS-15 and the RM-16 or commercial highway and, and, and whatever. It, it may be that we will be going into a time when we look at, at that again, because it's a very reoccurring theme. And, and many of the people who participated in the decision at, at that time and, and, and when we, we adopted that program, there we have other people now who, who weren't part of that discussion. So it may be that we'll be, we'll be returning to that issue. Whatever we adopt, we, it, will, it will probably come to play on, on places like this. This is exactly what I call an interface, an interface between residential and another type of land use capability. So whether or not the uh, 250 is, is, is perfect, I think it's appropriate. Uh, I think that our current buffering program is good, it's basic, it's demonstrated a success, but it may be that we need to be looking at those, those things again. And I, and I think I think we will be. What are the wishes of the Planning Commission on this? Any other questions or comments, clarifications? <coughs> We've got all our experts here. Well, I, I think that, you know, I, I like having the notch area remain the RS-15. I, I really like the 250-foot the uh, commercial fringe, whether exactly 250, but that, I mean, that, that certainly is, is fine and, and seems to be sub substantial enough. Um, I, I believe that on Memorial Boulevard that the commercial highway zoning <coughs> is an appropriate zoning, or at some point in the future, that is just just, just what it's going to be. Um, and so, whether that's now or, or later is, you know, doesn't really doesn't really matter. Uh, they, they're requesting it now. The property owners want it now. Um, I, I, I would be in, in favor of the. Um, what we're looking at on this proposed zone, as was presented um, tonight, this this group. The amendment letter. The amendment letter, as well as the blue areas that leaving out the one little notched property that's left out on here, leaving out the two hatched areas, um, and rezoning uh, the remaining blue areas to commercial highway with the 250-foot buffer on the back to commercial fringe. Um, and I would make a motion for that. Second. Did I cover that? Uh, I think you did. I understand very clearly. What you are saying is a 250-foot straight buffer all the way on the, the back of the blue area, take out the breedings and the ALSA property. Uh, Leave the notch RS-15 mm -hmm. and uh, otherwise adopt the uh, proposed amendment that they made. Okay. Yes. Any other okay. questions on that? Because we have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, motion passes. Our next item is a public 
hearing a zoning application for RPD amendment for approximately 12.6 acres along Memorial Boulevard. Mr. Ross Bradley, applicant. Ms. Ely, are you? Uh, I'm going to present this. Okay, Ms. Ms. Adelon. Uh, the proposed application is for the property at 3343 Memorial Boulevard. This property was approved as a planned residential development earlier this year, late last year, to um, allow for the development of a multiple family <coughs> development. That um, development had a program book, and it uh, looked very similar to this. The difference was that after they got into the final designs, they began to look at the roofs again and the uh, some of the uh, HVAC, HVAC uh, units, heat and air, and felt that instead of having them on the ground uh, and have to screen them around the building, they'd rather put them on the roof and go to a flat roof, a more urban-looking roof. Uh, accordingly, they have asked for an amendment to their program book. Uh, during our work session, we heard from Mr. David Code, who presented to us. He walked through what the changes were. This uh, basically revolved around the, the roof, and also a change of materials. Instead of hardy plank on some of the exterior walls, looking at a drive, uh, it would still be the uh, predominantly masonry buildings, uh, but this program book would be the amended plan uh, as they want it to be. Uh, I think there was a, a letter that was included with your <coughs> agendas at the last meeting or actually handed out at the meeting that went uh, point by point the uh, pages where the changes were made, uh, but that was the uh, gist of it. As an amendment to the program book, it re is basically a rezoning. It requires the Planning Commission conduct a public hearing and then to uh, formulate a recommendation to Council. I'll be very upfront with you. I, I don't see a big difference in the plan, and actually I, I kind of, in some respects, well, I kind of like the roof. I, at first, I, um, uh, I felt it was my responsibility to give a lot of pushback to Mr. Code, in part out of jest uh, as a uh, professional. But then as I looked at aerial, not at aerial photographs, but at photographs, <clears throat> saw the renderings, I think it kind of warmed up to it. Uh, it does not detract from the proposed building program. <clears throat> you need to conduct a public hearing. I think Mr. Ross Bradley is present to answer your questions. Mr. Bradley, you have any, you want to have any comments before we have the public hearing? I think that's perfect. It's a relatively simple change, we feel like. All right. We'll open. Uh, before we open the public hearing, I would like to ask you to come before, if you want to speak for or against this matter, to come before podium, uh, state your name as these are recorded, uh, speak uh, approximately three minutes unless you're representing a group. Uh, any questions that you might have will be answered at the conclusion of the public hearing. Uh, and with that, I'll open the public hearing and ask for anyone to come forward. Anyone want to speak or against? If not, we're going to close the public hearing. One question. Ms. Jones. The buildings uh, C1 through C4 that I guess are the carport or garage areas? Yes, ma'am. They still have the uh, hip, hip roof Right, type. and they're not changing those they're at all. They're leaving those Th like Those are, of course, shorter buildings, mm -hmm. and they are uh, basically in the back. Yeah, okay. I'm not sure I'm seeing it all correctly. Any other questions or comments on this? Mr. Vice Chairman Young, if there's no other questions or comments, I'll make a motion that we approve subject to all staff comments. Second the motion. Have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Our next item is the gateway design overlay. Toyota of Murfreesboro, final design and site plan review for 45,950. Five square foot vehicle dealership on 6.81 acres, zone CH and GD01, located along Interstate 24, Bill Smith Drive, and Fortress Boulevard, TT and T Murfreesboro Developer. Zeely. Thank you, Chairman Young. Um, our first item under the, and only item under the Gateway Design Overlay District is to review 
the final design review for, and the site plan approval for a new vehicle dealership located along Bill Smith Drive, north of Medical Center Parkway, Fortress Boulevard, and along Interstate 24. You have had an opportunity to, opportunity to review these plans, and um, the action was deferred at our last meeting on approving the site plan and, and final design review upon the applicant uh, addressing some comments, one of which was that staff required or wanted a circulation plan for vehicles, and that was submitted to us. And upon reviewing that plan, the, uh, the, or upon reviewing the circulation plan, one of the driveways did need to be widened so it could accommodate those vehicles. So we're very glad that we've been able to see that information and address that. There are also um, several other items that the applicant has been able to address. I've got on the screen a an, an, an rendering of the elevation of the building, and they have revised the elevations as we discussed in our previous meeting. The applicant has also been to the Board of Zoning Appeals, and Mr. Halberton attended that, and has, was granted some variances to our requirement but for the separation of a building to the adjacent parking or access area. Also, the applicants have been to the Water and Sewer Board, and they have approved their request to abandon a portion of the water and sewer easement that runs along Interstate 24, so the plan that we're seeing should be able to work for that. And then um, the, it appears that they've been able to address almost all the staff comments. There's one that hasn't been addressed, which is a staff comment, so if you approve this subject all staff comments, it's something that they'll still need to address. And there's one row of eight parking spaces that doesn't have landscape islands. They sh it should begin and terminate. Each row of parking should begin and terminate with a landscape island. And that's not a j gateway standard, but it's actually just a general standard for parking lots in Murfreesboro. I think due to some miscommunication between other staff members and the team, they thought that that the, maybe the landscape island shouldn't be installed, but it absolutely should. It's required, and our ordinance requires it. So um, there will need to be a small revision to the plans um, after tonight's meeting if you do approve it. And, of course, I recommend that your approval be a subject to all of our staff comments. Otherwise, it's in a fairly good order. I do have the sample board behind uh, Mrs. Jaco, and I don't know if the cameras can get that, but you should have seen these, and they should be familiar to the, you. They haven't changed, and they're members of the team that are here um, this evening. And I don't think that they have a presentation prepared, but if you have questions, they're glad to answer them. Questions for the design team or anyone else? <laughs> Mr. Huddleston, you're not going to speak on this? <laughs> Mr. Lukens is... Uh, paid to represent this. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we're in agreement with uh, with adding the two islands and beyond that, I guess everybody's seen the project and the, and the elevation. So really, if you have any questions, we can answer. First, sir, would you introduce yourself to us? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Jim Lukens, Lukens Engineering Consultants. We have picked this plan over, what, four times? <laughs> Three. Five, including BVA. <laughs> should, should be a whole lot. Of, I think it's oh, very, Lily, very you, nice you, plan. You strong arm them into putting those land, land state, landscape islands in. I believe we have. I also have examples of the pavers that'll be used in the parking lot. That's why I have in front of me these uh -huh. rows of blocks. That was All my right. creative way of displaying it. Mm -hmm. um, but they do are using three different colors, and I met with the landscape architect today to help define the areas adjacent to the building, separate from some other areas. And there's a special blend called the Henley blend that um, was made just for Murfreesboro for the Henley station, and they're going to incorporate that in their site. So that's a neat concept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. help tie some of the features together, and then they have a, a redder brick that they'll use to delineate, and then, of course, this grayer brick. And these are all permeable pavers. So this is what a paver looks like, and you can see the notches, just in case you're interested, so that there's a space between them so that water can filter to the storage area beneath them. But these are those, um, those materials. And this is the only type of material I will accept not on a material board compliant with our standards. <laughs> they won't quite stay on that material board. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, if there's no other questions or comments, um, I, I do think it's a very nice plan, and, and they've worked very hard on it, as has all the staff. Appreciate all that hard work, and I would make a motion to approve subject to all staff comments. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? <coughs> motion passes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Our next item is plats and plans. A is Pebble. Pebble Creek, Section 2, Phase 1, 
preliminary plat for 15 lots on 4.78 acres zone PRD <coughs> loca located along Sandstone Drive and Joshua Shane Drive. Mike Colvin, developer. Ms. Thank, Ely? thank you, sir. Our first item under plats and plans is to review a preliminary plat for Pebble Creek subdivision is the section two of Pebble Creek subdivision located just south of section one. And this is adjacent to Bushman Creek and you can see that on the plans that you have before you. Um, it is owned PRD, Plan Residential District, and the plan appears to comply with that zoning, the program book that was approved for that. Um, this item was deferred at our previous meeting, the May 15th meeting, due to the plan <coughs> not complying with our mini minimum lot size requirements and also for them not complying with our subdivision regulations and street specifications. Unfortunately, Mr. Huddleston um, appears to have left, but this is his project. So um, <laughs> if you have questions, you may have to defer it. But if I can answer your questions, we may be able to take action on it tonight. Um, we did. We have been able to review this, and it appears that they have been able to address those concerns we had about the streets and its design and um, it's being able to function and provide emergency services when there's a 100-year event. And so um, these plans are in much better shape and are ready for you to prove subject to off-staff comments. If you have questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Um, but Mr. Huddleston has done a good job revising this. Any questions or comments? If not, Vice Chairman, I move for approval of subject on staff comment. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Our next items is the Villas of Twin Oaks, master plan and preliminary plat for 34 lots on 14.5 acres, zoned RM along Twin Oak Drive, and served as an outside of the city sewer customer, J of an RCK joint venture developer. Is Thank you. Our next plan that we're going to review is a preliminary plat for 34 lots on 14.5 acres that is zoned RM and is located in Rutherford County. It's not within Murfreesboro city limits. This site is being served as an outside the city sewer customer. As such, they are required to submit plans to both Rutherford County and to the city of Murfreesboro and meet our standards. So they are required not only to meet the county's but the city's standards. This site was tied up in a lawsuit for several years. This plan was initially reviewed by the County Planning Commission um, several years ago, and I really don't know how many, but it has been several. Um, and finally, there has been a conclusion to that matter, and the, I think, courts have, um, have told Rutherford County that they need to re re approve the plan. That plan was never submitted to the city. It never got approval from the city and there's no vested uh, rights in that. So we've reviewed the plan and we've uh, asked the Jamie Reed, who's the, um, the the engineer on the plan, to address some comments and look at the site. I believe he's got a rep Are you representing Jamie tonight? Yes. Okay. So Doug Jenkins with SEC is representing Jamie. If we have questions, we may need to ask Mr. Jenkins. But this, um, this plat complies with the lot requirements and with that contract that we have with the Murfreesboro Water and Sewer Department saying that they have to have a minimum lot size and that's basically a minimum of 15,000 square feet and they are able to meet setbacks. The sewer is be being extended from the adjacent subdivision which is Garrison Cove. There were some um, items which we requested the applicant address and that was to add some sidewalks within the subdivision because of course that's something that we in Murfreesboro uh, require developers to put in for our future residents. We also wanted some improvements to Twin Oak Drive, some turn lanes into the subdivision, and some sidewalks. Um, the applicant met with the planning director to discuss these items and um, has requested a variance from those requirements in that the county, Rutherford County Road Board, he said, um, does not want those improvements to Twin Oak Drive. Twin Oak Drive is not a city street. It is still in the county, so if it is Rutherford County's preference, the road to not have that turn lane, it would be staff's recommendation that we not require that because it's not our street. Um, and then also dealing with the sidewalk. So what we've tasked Mr. Reed with is contacting both the county road board and the county planning director, getting letters from them stating that these changes are not something they want. And if that is what happens, then we recommend that this plan is approved without those improvements, which are identified on staff comments. Of course, if the county yeah. wants those improvements, then we would recommend that the decision you make be that they be installed. But we are comfortable um, 
deferring to the county, since this is a county subdivision and these are county roads and not city streets, um, if that's their judgment, then we would recommend that that's what we go with. But So any approval that you have, you, you may want to make for this preliminary plat, we would ask that you make it subject to um, the county approving the changes, either requiring them or not requiring them. And I know Mr. Adelot had the conversation. I wasn't involved in that, so if you had more to add about it. Um, You've done a very good job of laying it out and explaining it. I do have one question. Is it, I understand the county not wanting the sidewalks on Twin Oak Drive, but what about the sidewalks inside the subdivision itself? Are that wasn't a comment that we asked for, and the same response to that it was that they didn't want the sidewalk to think another complication may be um, that the county was told to approve this plan as submitted by the courts, and so they think yeah. that maybe changing those pl plans might, mm -hmm. might throw a wrench in something. And so we certainly don't want to interfere with any decisions made by courts. And, um, and they probably don't want to be maintaining sidewalks. We would, that's we would ask that the uh, developers provide to us the written request so we have it documented and the justification uh, to uh, verify the uh, situation that they find themselves in. And if that's the case, we understand. We, there's no reason for the city to be uh, particularly difficult on the matter, and we don't intend to be. Can I get one clarification? Are, are, we're looking at this as a master plan and a preliminary plat for 34 lots. So are we just looking at one section, and if so, which section? Or it's, what? Yeah, it's the master plan for the whole subdivision, mm -hmm. and it's the preliminary plat for only 34 lots. There are more lots to be reviewed, and the initial plans were not – and. The initial plans are what you have on your iPad. They were not clear on what is Section 1 and what's Section 2. And that was actually Mr. Huddleston's comment was identify what's going to be Section 1, Section 2. So the paper copies, which are a little bit, which are newer, um, they came after I published your agenda, should have that more clearly identified. So our, our agenda does, you didn't know at the time the agenda was done which section was the 34 lots. Mm -hmm. So is it Section 1? It should be. Mr. Jenkins. Okay. Jenkins. Okay. Yeah, it was unclear. Hi, I'm Doug Jenkins from SEC Engineering. But yes, this would be Section 1, which is the 34 lots. So looking at the whole master plan for the whole subdivision and then Section 1 for a preliminary plat with the 34 lots in Section 1. Okay. So they would have to submit a preliminary plat for the next sections, mm -hmm. but not anything for the master plan unless they want to revise the master plan. Okay. I, I think based on the, you know, uh, basically what, what we have to deal with here, I mean, the, the, the master plan itself looks good um, and as far as I would think the streets and the way the lots are laid out and everything and uh, the preliminary plat for Section 1. Um, I would make a motion to approve subject to all staff comments specifically, including the ones, you know, regarding the items that were needed from the county uh, for approval. Second. Have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Our next item is window of the world site plan for 4,950 square feet wholesale retail store on .052 acres zoned LI, located along South Point Court, Window World of Middle Tennessee, the developer. Ms. Ely. Thank you. This, uh, this first site plan we'll be reviewing under, under the Plats and Plans portion of our meeting is for Window World, which um, is an item that was also deferred at our May 15th meeting, and it was deferred, or I think this item, I think when I say deferred, actually the applicants withdrew them temporarily to improve their plans that were not in good shape. So they've come back to you. Um, with the revised plan. This is for property that's along South Point Court, and it also is adjacent to Interstate 24. This is a site plan review for a new 4,950 square foot retail store, which will be selling windows and those type of accessories, located on lot 37 within the South Point Business Campus. It's located between South Point Court and Interstate 24. The property is zoned LI, Light Industrial District, and the proposed use is permitted within the LI District. Um, it was withdrawn due to concerns we had about circulation, and um, one of the major concerns we had was that the previous plan was showing a dock, a dock that was not accessible by trucks to deliver. So we thought that that was um, something that needed to be addressed because if you're going to 
if that's a, a part of your business, we want it to work. And so um, staff, and particularly Mr. Balachandra, worked with the engineer to give us some simulations and associated data to show us how the property would be served. It demonstrated that it couldn't be, the dock could not be served. So the engineer, Mr. Huddleston, met with the client, talked to him about that. And so the plan you have now removes the dock. Client said he didn't really need it and want it. So that aspect has been taken off of the plan. Still requires, the site still requires a uh, delivery vehicle to circle around South Point Court and back into the site. But um, it's less it's less stop and goes than it was before. So the access is, or their ability to get in there is improved, much enhanced from what you saw before. Also, the um, the width of the driveway has, or the width of the drive aisle has been reduced, and the building has been shifted toward South Point Court a little bit more to provide for that required landscaping yard located along the rear property line, which is that property line with Interstate 24. The landscaping plan for this still needs a little, to have a little bit of work. We met with uh, Mr. Kane Adams with the Urban Environmental Department this afternoon, and um, his comments are minor, but there still are some. So that's really the outstanding issue would be to revise some of that landscaping. But I think that that's something that we certainly can do if you decide to approve this subject to all staff comments. I have a, um, a photograph of a window world that is in another location. They haven't designed, an architect designed anything specific to this site. But you can see they use different materials on it as sort of an advertisement. I'll go ahead and hand this to Mr. Halliburton um, if you want to take a look at the building. Uh, we, of course, would require them to screen any rooftop equipment and um, address both, both rights of way when they do submit those uh, architectural plans. Otherwise, the plan seems to be in fairly good order. And if you have, it would be staff's recommendation that your approval will be subject to all staff comments. Ms. Ailey, initially there were some problems with this site plan, and, and, and I, I assume after listening to what you said, you've worked out the great majority of them. Yes, sir, and especially the ones that concerned us. The, 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 and, and everything else can be done administratively? It can. Prior to, per, prior that, to them receiving any permits, right. we'll make sure the landscaping is addressed. How, how do you... Was the problem corrected to keep the truck from backing up and back and up and back in the cul-de-sac? Um, Move the driveway some? Did the drive, it, well, I'm not sure because. I mean, how, how do you well, fix that? Well, frankly, they decided to circle the uh, cul-de-sac properly. Oh, with right. their, but they demonstrated the proper way to circulate on the cul-de-sac. For some reason, the uh, previous designs had the uh, poor truck driver having to go about everything backwards causing him to take three movements in the cul-de-sac. Once they calibrated the way a truck driver should drive, using the rules of the road by being on the right, right side, side of the road, road, they found out that they could just back, they just turn the cul-de-sac and then back right into the side. Okay. So they go <laughs> counterclockwise as opposed to yeah. clockwise. Mm -hmm. once, once the problem was identified, it was an easy solution. Okay. It was a missing use of the program that shows how to do it. <laughs> All right. Any other questions or comments? Did you try up? Let me, I got one question. Um, we're saying that the docks were eliminated, but the site plan shows two docks. Um, the site, the paper site plan that you have does not. I, what, when I published the agenda is before they revised their plans, so what goes in, on your PDFs is the first submittal. It goes along with the staff comments that you initially received. So, so the, they did not give me, I didn't get revised PDFs So the before. 10 doors will not have docks. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They'll be at, at, at parking lots. Great. I'm with the, you. The dock that was removed was actually four feet. Had a four foot dock outside the door. So a truck could back into it. That's been removed. But, but they'll still be able to back to the door and maneuver. Forklift, fork yeah. trucks. Okay. Pilot jacks, those sorts of things. Just take material out of the trucks. That's true. Right. That's I'm what you don't know about. Okay. That, that will work. So what they're doing will... They can do what they want to do without a dock. They, yeah, the owner said he could, and that's how they operate now. 
Do you agree? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to approve the subject to all staff comments. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Our next item, Kroger site plan for 42,199 square foot addition to the existing grocery store and the addition of two fuel pumps to the existing fuel center on 11.9 acres on Commercial Highway at 2946 South Church Street, Kroger Limited Partnership Development. Ms. Ely, yes, you? sir. That's me, your faithful site plan reviewer. <laughs> um, our next item and final site plan review item is for the expansion of Kroger located along South Church Street. The, exist, the expansion will almost double the size of the Kroger. The planned expansion is 42,199 square feet, and that's in addition to what currently exists. Um, you did review the site plan for the fuel pumps. They will be adding a couple fuel pumps and expanding the canopy, I believe, for those fuel pumps, and that was approved a couple months ago. Um, the site plan portion of this was not reviewed and approved by you because we were waiting on some additional information from the applicant for them to do a traffic analysis, and that traffic analysis has been done and turned into staff, and we'll go through those changes in just a moment. I do have um, the proposal, and I'll ask, if, would you mind putting the Kroger sample board on the easel? Um, they have provided us with the building elevations for the Kroger as it is proposed to be expanded. And I have those on the screen now, and you can see that it is a masonry building, entirely masonry building, and they've added some interest to the roof line. They've provided us with some, the material samples, and those are on the easel now, and um, they are consistent with the area, and I think they look good, and this expansion will look good when it's developed, as has been shown to us, with the entrance being uh, accented with some stone features, and you can see those. The um, site plan has been, they've been able to address our comments on the site plan. I think there's just a few very small comments, and so if you do approve the plan, I would recommend that you make it subject to all staff comments. But one of the um, points that, or something I wanted to point out to you is that this, the, um, the intersection of Innsbruck Boulevard and South Church Street, which is what folks use to exit the Kroger because it has a signalized intersection rather than trying to cross all lanes of the highway, they'll use that, inter uh, that signalized intersection. It showed that there will be an increase in traffic and so we wanted to, to see how that could be managed and actually how it can be improved because there is a subdivision that uses that street as well. And as a matter of fact, there's, Mr. Gilly lives there so he's mm -hmm. familiar with it, but there's landscape islands on Innsbruck Boulevard and there's a sign in Innsbruck Boulevard. and. Um, Across the street is the new driveway for the Goodwill store, but there's also a couple out, out parcels that will be developed in the future. We fully inspect one of them to be, expect one of them to be a restaurant. So that drive um, has attempted to line up with this drive so they have a positive uh, connection point. And then, so the traffic analysis said, well, remove the landscape island and have more lanes so that you can turn. And staff looked at this and thought, well, you know, we know how important this landscape island is to the people who are in the subdivision and Innsbruck subdivision. So we asked the uh, engineering team to and the design team to go back and look at what they could do. So um, they looked at a couple things. They looked at either expanding the street um, on the far farthest side, which is the southernmost side, where they have on each side they have some round signs as well. And they looked at reducing the size of the landscape island because we said removing it really is not the best option and we wouldn't want to do that. And so we found out that um, e expanding the lane to the side, um, to the outermost lane, really wasn't the best option and, I, and I'll have representative of the engineering team speak to you about why that didn't work, but essentially there are utilities there, there's another sign there, and then the, the relocation of the sidewalk would cause it to run right into the back of, a, of that sign and um, and some of that work may require easements on private property. However, if they can make modifications to the center landscape island, it's working the right way. They don't need to acquire any additional um, easements or anything like that. But the, they're going to put everything back as you see it. So the sign will need to be taken down. They're going to put it right back up, but they're going to have to move the location over a couple feet. Put the landscaping back, the decorative lighting, all that will go back. It's just the width of the landscape island will be reduced, thereby giving an extra lane. and. Um, 
for traffic to turn. And Mr. Balachandra has reviewed this extensively, and I know had conversations with the design team. And, and actually, another benefit of making modifications to the landscape island would be that the lanes can um, line up appropriately, appropriately, because if you if we made a modification to the south, there would be kind of a, an odd jog. And also, there's the signal operation. Mr. Balachandra looked at how the signals operate. And I don't know all those details, but I, I know there's, you know, he wants lefts to go at the same time and not wait for one left to go, and then you have to wait for the other left to go. So operationally, it would be best with this design. Um, we know that any change sometimes is viewed with some uh, skepticism. So we uh, would like to maybe reach out to the Homeowner Association, let them know what's going on, let them know that this will improve the situation out there as it is now, but also knowing that the store size is going to double and any additional park or traffic that's going to be generated out, out there, it will improve that as well, and that there will be a, a change, but their sign will remain. And it will, um, we don't currently allow signs in the right-of-way anymore, but they have a vested right in that, and moving it over a couple feet is not going to remove that, and it's going to allow the sign to remain there because they were approved by Planning Commission in the early 90s. I think it was like 96. So they, the sign it was a lawfully established non-conforming structure. But um, I think I've talked quite a bit. I'll go ahead and let the design team talk about the site plan. If you have any questions, of course, I'll be glad to answer them. Mr. Balachandra will be glad to answer them. Uh, I know he knows this intimately as well. I guess all of staff will all, we'll all be glad to answer them, but I would like to guess, help you if I can. But did, would you like to add anything about the store or the... My name is Randy Harper with Perry Engineering, uh, uh, here representing Kroger. Uh, I also have uh, uh, a gentleman from uh, Kroger here tonight uh, as well, uh, Mr. Jim Gavigan. Uh, we've uh, looked at this uh, issue with the, uh, the sign and the median uh, there on Innsbruck uh, pretty extensively, and uh, Rom and I have talked about it several times. Uh, the, we looked at widening, again, to the south, as, as Morgan Ann had said, um, and I've, I've put together kind of a, a photograph, uh, kind of laid out kind of where that lane would be and how it would impact the, the existing sign. But uh, on each side of in the Innsbruck intersection there, there are two stone walls that kind of wrap mm -hmm. around. Those walls actually project into the right-of-way. So it effectively narrows down the width of the right-of-way there. Uh, when we widen, if we just widen to the south and leave the center median alone, uh, the uh, lane would be over top of the existing sidewalk. If we put the sidewalk back in, uh, we can't get it through. It, it comes in on the back side of that uh, stone wall. So we would either have to shorten the stone wall, take the stone wall out, and, and change that part of it. Uh, the sidewalk would be right on the edge of the right-of-way. Uh, there's also some underground electric uh, power there, uh, some other uh, underground utilities there that would, we would need to be uh, relocating. Uh, where the sidewalk would intersect with the sign, there's a grade, a change in grade there as well. Uh, where we would, if we just ex extended the road slopes out, uh, we would be below actually the bottom of that sign. We would expose the foundation of it. So we would actually have to cut it back a little bit more in order to fit that lane and sidewalk through. So wh what we've proposed is to do the widening uh, in the middle, uh, moving the island over, moving the sign over, just keep the same size, same sign, put it back exactly as it is and just sh narrow the width of the median there, and uh, if you will, uh, I'd like to just pass out a couple of these, kind of, I always say a picture's worth a thousand words, so I've got a, a picture here that kind of shows where the lanes would be, where the sidewalk would be, and you kind of see where the sign is uh, if we had to widen to the south. Um. kind of see there the there's a, a couple of sets of red lines that show uh, on either side of the sidewalk we would maintain the white stripe on the existing road uh, you kind of see a couple of feet off the right behind the back of the sidewalk would be where the uh, edge of the curb and gutter would be and you'd have the sidewalk behind it kind of the the big bush there that you see directly in front of that uh, sidewalk width, that's where the column is on the wall sign on the south side. So that, that particular issue, when you, when you actually move the sidewalk over the property line, it really gets into the trees there on the bank side, and we wouldn't want to damage those as well because they're 
uh, fairly mature tree. So that's kind of why we'd like to do the, the widening in the, in the center. Move the sign over and we'll replace the landscaping in kind. And I'd be glad to answer any questions. Uh, anybody else has any, anything? I would like to point out this work is being done by Kroger. And so these improvements that will benefit not just the patrons in Kroger, but people in the subdivisions and shopping around there. And the money being spent isn't by the city, but these improvements are being done by the developer, which is Kroger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that you'll see too is, is as the Goodwill develops across the street, we're adding the Goodwill's adding a fourth leg to that traffic signal. Uh, when they add that fourth leg, it's going to actually cause further delay uh, to the the people coming out of the Innsbruck subdivision. When we add this uh, extra additional left turn lane, it actually reduces the delay. Uh, after Kroger said and done, it actually reduces the, the delay back to about what it was or a little bit less than what it was before the left lanes added. So it actually makes a big improvement to the to the function of the intersection. And I think that's good because you know like Margaret said, I live out there in that area and, and I because of the stacking normally on this street, I will normally use the apron the Kroger and just wait to cross all those lanes of traffic to go back north as opposed to going down to the light rather than waiting in the stacking line. I would rather wait there than I would to, to sit through four changes of the, of the same <laughs> signal. Um, the other question, now, the, the space for the, the building, what's going out? Because there's stuff on both sides of the, of the Kroger that's out there now. So for the expansion of the building itself is what I'm trying to get a grasp on of what's going away or how what we're doing is actually taking out about 15 to 15, 16,000 square feet of the existing shops. Okay. There'll be about three shops left on the end, and we're widening all the way back so that it, it squares up the back with the back of the program. Okay. Building. So, so it's, it's your, your satellite part you're leasing out to right now that you're just. Yes, sir. There'll the actually be there. a couple more tenants there that, that will eventually have leases. Okay. Good. Uh, are, you, are you on both sides? Or is it just one side? No, it's just on one side. Just one side. That'd be yeah. the north side, right? Right now, Basically. that's correct. Right now, the Kroger goes all the way over to the Innsbruck side. That's where the pharmacy drive-thru is. All the widening is going to be to the, to to the, the north, north side. To the north side. Yes, sir. How far in the back? In the rear end? Uh, it goes all the way back to the back wall of the existing Kroger. You're not getting rid of my Jersey mics, are you? <laughs> They're relocating with I, to uh, one of the side places. I, I've already asked. Okay, good. <laughs> good. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> they will be relocating, but they will still be out there. Okay, good. <laughs> well, this is a significant development in our community. I'm glad to see it happen. <clears throat> Ms. Ely, is there anything else we need to work on with this? Any so questions? Subject to all staff comments, I think it's in good shape. They've also um, received some mandatory approval mandatory referral approval from the Planning Commission and City Council to abandon some portion of the water and sewer easement located in the rear of the building where the expansion is going. So what they'll be required to do is to build the new, get that operational, then they can take out the old. But that's already been done. So they're in, I think they're ready to move forward. Seeing none, I recommend approval. Subject to all staff comments. Second. <clears throat> Have a motion and second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next item is staff reports and other business. Ms. Day Lott. It'll be me. Yes, sir. Uh, under this segment of the uh, agenda, I've, I want to talk to the Planning Commission a little bit about the uh, amendments to the zone ordinance and to the zone map regarding the GDO district. And first of all, I want to start talking about the mixed use district. Uh, well, actually, first of all, I want to put things in perspective. The uh, city adopted the current GDO regulations in late 2003, early 2004. So believe it or not, we're approaching our 10-year anniversary on the Gateway Design Overlay District regulations. Uh, it's been a uh, something that uh, we've had some experience with now. We've seen the uh, Gateway begin to uh, grow. I will not say it's mature yet, but it is uh, growing, and it, we have seen a lot of uh, developments. And we've learned a lot of the, about the process. Uh, the plan staff has learned how to talk with uh, property owners about the process, how to deal with the uh, design teams, and we've learned uh, how to move people through the process. 
what they expect out of it, what they fear about it, what you expect a little bit out of it, and where, where the hang-ups seem to be. So uh, that's one of the things that has been on my mind lately about the gateway. Also, the land out there. Some of the land has been properly zoned from the get-go. Some of it has not been. A big part of the property out there is zoned off as general in the gateway west of Thompson Lane, north of the uh, Medical Center Parkway. Office General is a, is a good buffer zone at the right places, but for the type of uh, vision that we have uh, begun to see for the, uh, the gateway, I don't believe, as the city's plan director, as a, as a practicing planner, that it promotes the type of development that we really want to see in, in that area. Certainly with the opportunities that the uh, property presents in terms of location, <clears throat> in, in terms of the inertia that area has, Office General is going to be a zoning district that holds that area back, especially recognizing that we have a design review process that every development goes through, that we look at it carefully. Uh, with regards to the land that the city owns, which is predominantly in the GDO number three district, the, uh, um, most, the greatest part of that area is zoned light industrial. It was zoned industrial in the county before it was annexed. We've kept it. One of the, the things that has uh, kept it from uh, going in a bad direction in, in terms of industrial it has been these, the GDO regulations and the, and the restrictive covenants that the city placed on the land as the land developer. Uh, lots of times we, we neglect the role that, that, that the city played on that property, but the city placed the restrictive covenants on much of the land around the hospital uh, east of uh, Thompson Lane along the Medical Center Parkway. And uh, those restrictions uh, with a design review committee, in addition to the gateway design regulations, have served to really move that property into a very positive direction. Uh, pause and reflect for a moment the industrial, light industrial buildings we were seeing on the uh, Thompson Lane uh, that first were constructed. Uh, not wanting to say bad of them, but th there was no movement by the city to push them into a higher quality. And once we began to see what was happening, we saw a need to do that. And, and I think we, uh, we will all reflect for a moment and say that the original buildings constructed out there are nowhere near as um, appealing as the ones that have come later during the design process. And because we got the process going, property owners expect to raise the bar. So uh, one of the things that I have had on my mind has been a, a new zone district. I made a report to the Planning Commission a couple of months ago about the idea of, of working on one. I have worked on something and, and want to present tonight that's called the Mixed Use District. Uh, one of the things about the Office General and about the Light Industrial Zone is that neither one allows for residential uses of any kind. Uh, we, we are seeing a need, and in other areas where we see uh, uh, gateway-type districts in other communities, a need for a mixture of uses. The uh, residential adds a, another dimension to it. And, and all, not all land can be or should be developed uh, commercially in an in a area like that. So the mixed-use district is designed to allow for a, uh, a, var a variety of type of uses. Uh, the uh, materials I handed out to you is a, a draft of a uh, proposed amendments. They include making provisions for landscaping, making provisions for buffering, making provisions for setbacks. Uh, we're looking at a urbanistic type of a uh, development pattern when the property does not front directly upon the Medical Center Parkway. If it fronts directly upon the Medical Center Parkway, we're requiring some additional setbacks to give it the, the, the type of feel that we're wanting to see on that road. Uh, if you've had a chance to, to read those regulations, you'll see that it, it is different than any other zone district that the city has. Uh, it allows for residential, but it does not allow for single-family residential. It requires nine acres for a multifamily site. And that's calibrated to allow uh, at, uh, a complex with enough, uh, uh, I guess you might say, uh, number of units to create a management regime that the property will, will be managed well. We don't want to, I, I don't like to see small apartment complexes because management is often a, a problem in them. So the nine acres almost assures that there'll be enough units uh, and enough quality to, to see a good management. It also allows a density at 25 units per acre, if they want to go that direction, that uh, they could have uh, parking structures. We have seen uh, some uh, people who came in to test the, uh, the waters for some multi-story, uh, multi-family buildings with parking structures. 
uh, and they were very desirable. One of them that we've seen that, that we, we all, I think, like is the uh, Gateway Village that the uh, Swansons have done immediately adjacent to the hospital. Mm-hmm. That type of development could be done under the, the MU district that we're proposing. It, both the commercial and residential combined with that type of density that he has in that building without going through the plan development process, but by going through the GDO design review process. Uh, the um, mixed-use district would uh, allow for additional setback requirements uh, for additional height. When you go up to the taller buildings, you'd want to have some additional heights. Uh, since the time I made this draft, I have paused to reflect that maybe for a multifamily that some of the, the heights may need to be adjusted downward, and, and I'm going to be taking a look at that before we go to a public hearing. But uh, at this point, for presentation to you and to the, to the community, this is where I'm standing with, prep, with the idea that we'll be, we'll be looking at those numbers again. So I, I'm excited about the prospect of creating this um, mixed-use district. I'm not going to read the entire district. I hope you've had a chance to read it. Uh, it was with your agenda materials. Now I want to talk a moment about the uh, places where it would be applicable. Uh, basically, the area that we'd be looking at would be the area south of uh, Wilkinson Pike, north of uh, Medical Center Parkway. Uh, it would also include the area along Robert Rose, uh, south of Medical Center Parkway. It would include the land that the city owns that's uh, not already developed. And it would include some land that the city owns that would be uh, that's the current demolition landfill adjacent to Stones River uh, that we'd like to be able to see develop in a, a beneficial use someday. It's a demolition landfill, but part of the site has, has development capability. <coughs> Uh, I believe in the agenda materials I showed you a, a, a draft really hoping to be a concept map with the expectation that as we went to a, a, a visioning process with the community and gained more input, we would probably return and, and redraw those boundaries. Uh, at this point, before I go into the regulations about the GDO, are there any questions about the MU district that I'm proposing? I like where you're going. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Greg. Okay. Mm-hmm. We've, we've had the other one for 10 years, and we found mm-hmm. some, some minor flaws <coughs> in it, and we're making some good corrections. All right. Now I want to talk a little bit about the Gateway Design Overlay District. I, <laughs> I, I laugh for a moment because I know I challenged you with this. This is the, this is the section of our zone ordinance that deals with the um, GDO district, and I have taken it out for a while, and I have worked on it. And I have tracked all the changes that would go with it so that all the changes that we're looking to make are in red. Uh, there's about 65 pages here, but when you really take out all the edits and, and the, the repetitions because of the edits, it, it gets it down to about 50 pages. Still, it's, it's a lot of text. But what, what you'll find here is that the, the greatest part of it is, is relatively minor, and it begins to uh, incorporate some of our practices. First of all, one of the things uh, we do are, are looking at changing the submittal requirements for initial design review, master plans, and final design review. And the requirements for changing, we are giving much clearer, much uh, better laid out checklist of what's expected of applicants. Now, I'm going to be very, very frank with you. Uh, I believe that I probably included a little bit too much required for the initial design review. And before we adopt it, we're going to probably back out some of that stuff because it's a little bit more. But, but what we've been finding is that the applicants come to the initial design review ready. They want to move. And, and the ones that are prepared, when it comes to final design, it's just, a, it's just a cakewalk. It's just so easy for them. Uh, it's the guys that are confused that gets mixed up and, or, or, or just to have a little bit difficult uh, communicating that have problems at final design review. It, the, the people that are prepared, it's a cakewalk. And I want to look at, a, I, I think that's a good practice. The applicants seem to want it. The engineers that we deal with seem to want it. And it seems to work good. If we can just almost have that as a consent agenda item for a final design, everybody seems to be very happy. Uh, so we're, give, we're, we're wanting to give very clear checklist, And that's not going to only help the people that you see. One of the things that, that you, may, you may need to reflect on when, when we do, do these kind of regulations that there is a part of the the team that we never see, and that's the poor guy that actually does the work for the engineer. The, the, he's the technician. He's the, he's the young guy that he has to do the work, whereas his seniors get to come to the meetings and talk uh, and present 
and, and all that. But there's somebody back at the office who's doing the work, and somebody's having to communicate to him. Well, I want to make the regulations clear to that guy, because if I don't get to him and I don't communicate to him very well, he's, he is confused, and his confusion will cause his, pro, his uh, plan to maybe have problems. So I want, to, I want to help the process by getting to the guy that's doing the work somewhere that we don't see very often. So a good, clear checklist will help him a whole lot because it's going to become a much clearer recipe of what he's supposed to do. Another thing we're doing is with the pre-designed conference. And I really, want to, I really want to tell you that I believe that these pre-designed conferences have been an overwhelming success. When we, the staff can sit down with an applicant, and we do, and discuss with them your expectations, our expectations, their expectations, communicate about what they're going to be doing, how it's going to proceed. It helps them immensely. In fact, I want to expand that eventually to all site plans. They're of a certain size. We already are doing it with subdivision plats, and when we, once in a while we have someone who forgets, but those who go through that pre-designed conference, it benefits everybody because we understand, they understand, and their project moves through the process much quicker and easier for them. So we're trying to make it, um, uh, give an agenda for those meetings that will be included in what, they, what they're seeing. So when they come to the meeting pre-designed, they know what we're going to talk about, and they know how it's going to proceed. It's not a mystery. In your professional lives, you all know one of the, the probably the frustrating things is when you have a meeting but you don't know what's going to be done, what's going to be accomplished, what you're expected to do, or how you need to be prepared. But when you do know what's expected of you, and you know what's going to be discussed, and you know how to be prepared, those meetings are very productive. And that's what we're trying to set these initial design uh, and pre-designed conferences up for. Uh, beyond that, most of the other changes are just relatively uh, cos uh, well, not even cosmetic. They're uh, editorial. They are really not substantive. They're, they're relatively minor. Now, one of the things that goes hand in hand with the regulations is the areas that are zoned. One of the things, and this actually would be in the mixed use district uh, that I want to, to see done, I believe should be done, and I really want you to, to consider with me, and that is the elimination of the BP overlay district. The, the BP overlay district pre-existed the GDO. Before we had the GDO, we had the BP. It was not about design review. It was about limiting certain land uses. It was not about a buffer. And one of the things was to provide a height that would be the same as it, the property was before the uh, property was annexed, which the, the county zoning allowed 35-foot height. So that was really what it did. It, lit, it prohibited some uses, and it established a maximum height. And beyond that, it really didn't do much. It did not do any kind of design review. It wasn't about brick. It wasn't about metal side buildings. It wasn't about the uh, um, arrangement of structures. It was about a maximum of 35 foot height and about limiting certain uses from being permitted. No tents, no itinerant vendors, uh, no stockyards, that sort of thing. When we created the GDO regulations, we duplicated those regulations into the GDO. Uh, and, and basically, the staff had the idea that we would, we would eliminate the BP. Well, somehow we did. And, and it has been a source of confusion for a lot of the people that we do business with. In a pre-designed conference where we I meet with people and we schedule an hour and we end up talking 10 minutes about the dead gum BP overlay district because they're confused about it, we've lost uh, a big part of our hour on an issue that is a non-issue. So it even has effects that you all never never see. And, and I know I've said in public hearings where there seems to be very strong ownership of that, but it is misplaced. The real protection is the GDO regulations, the design review process. So that's one issue that, that I think that I really want to appeal to you all to, to consider, because I want to make that as a recommendation as part of the, the MU uh, regulation, because the GDO is where the protection is. The BP is not. <coughs> One thing that I'm also going to recommend is that we change some of the GDO districts. A couple of examples. The Oaks Shopping Center is in GDO 3. 
Well, the GDL3, we're going to ex include additional uses, or actually we're going to exclude additional uses from it because the GDL3 is becoming more of a premier office type of uh, development use. It's not a retail environment. And I'm going to recommend that we put the Oak Shopping Center, take it out of GDO3, and put it in GDO1. Because that's where it should be. After all, it fronts on Thompson Lane. I'm going to recommend that a big part of Thompson Lane, in the area where we have rezoned properties for the purpose of, of getting additional height, which would include the Hampton Inn, the uh, Kennywood Suites, the uh, Parkway Plaza, the uh, Swanson structures of the Gateway Village. I'm going to recommend that that part of Thompson Lane, the south end of it, be changed to GDL1. Because that's really the only difference that there is in that area, the height. And we've already let those through a, either by variances or by going through the zoning process. Another area that I look at is the area that is uh, along Wilkerson Pike. There's a 500-foot strip of uh, GDO uh, 2, which is uh, more limiting, but reduce that down to 250 foot instead of 500 foot. Uh, at the same time, keeping the same protections. And then the third area, an area along uh, Medical Center Parkway where the, the demolition landfill is beside the river, make it GDO 1 also instead of GDO 3. So th there may be some additional tweaks, but these are three areas or four areas I've identified that really, as I look at it, they, we, we, we really need to go back and adjust their map because they're misplaced. They're, they're misplaced when we look at how the regulations are being applied and, and our experiences with those areas over the last 10 years. So that's a, a rundown of what I'm proposing. Um, what I wanted is some discussion from you is, is this the uh, right thing to do? Have I got buy-in from you to proceed with this? Because if I do have buy-in to proceed with this, I want to have a neighborhood meeting. I want, to, I want to get some public look at this. I want to get it posted on the Internet, and I want people to begin to see this and then have a chance to review it and give us some input back. As we've had, uh, as we did with the uh, CM district a couple of years ago, and the OG district around the old hospital site, uh, because I think uh, this is something that uh, the council wants this kind of uh, public participation. If I'm going in, in the wrong direction, please snatch me back from the abyss. Abyss. I don't want to go over it. Uh, uh, but if if I'm going in the right way, give me a pat on the back, and staff knows what to do. So, what are your thoughts about what I present to you? Taylor, I think it sounds good that you made the comment. I, I know on my tenure of being on this planning commission and, and some dealings with uh, the Wilkinson Pike area, uh, you, you mentioned you might be changing that, but the, the uh, requirements would be the same. I, I didn't quite follow that. Uh, you said that you would change the GDO territory, but the requirements would it stay the same with respects to Wilkinson Pike? Well, in terms of the gateway design review, it right. would. The southern half, the the front part, the 250-foot, 35-foot height would remain the same. Okay. The southern half, the remaining 250-foot, that 500-foot strip, would go to the same as GDO-1. Okay. okay. I think you're on the right track. That's good. I agree. I think you're on the right track because as we continue to make changes in our community, we have to make changes to zoning amendments to stay up to par. So I think we're on the right track. So it's a refinement of the original process. Uh, yes, it is. So it refinement is. of the original. Improving on it. It's a, a taking stock of where we've been and see where we need to go. Mm -hmm. I think the mixed use district is going to enhance the opportunities for more of a variety of development. The stores at the bottom and, and houses on the on the top. So I, you know, I, I think that's what we all want to go to, especially in the downtown area. And as Tom said, this is an improvement over looking back over 10 years where we've been and where we want to go and what improvements we can make. 
Well, I'm very encouraged by the plan commission's comments. It's, it's, Short though they are, I, I, I know a, 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 a pat on the back when I feel one. Mm -hmm. so, so what, my, my, um, my, my course of action now is to, to step back and refine these a little bit more because uh, uh, just before I left for vacation a couple of weeks ago, I still received some comments from other staff members. Uh, the city manager's office is already involved. They're, they're, they've been part of this discussion. Uh, I've got a couple more comments, but they're, they're minor to, to incorporate. Uh, then I'm going to begin what I call a little bit of a public relations, public outreach process where we will get things on the Internet, where we will advertise, maybe even get some signs up. Because uh, I think everybody that owns property out there has a, a stake. So we'll, we'll try to get, we'll have a meeting with the, uh, an open house type meeting. And uh, then we'll report back to the planning commission. It's going to be a couple of months. But uh, at that point, when we report back, we'll be about ready to move it into an ordinance format so that we can have a planning commission public hearing to formulate a recommendation. And that's the the course of action that I expect to take from here. Thank you. Does that conclude your business, Mr. Hall? Well, yes, it does. We we do have one more report, and that would be from you, Mr. Uh, Young. I uh, understand that you have a a report on roundabouts that you need to make. <laughs> I, due to the late hour, I will uh, address the roundabouts at another time. But uh, I have experienced many roundabouts and have done a detailed study of roundabouts. And I'm still going around about it. <laughs> <laughs> Are we finished for the We're through. Any other comments? If not, we're adjourned. <laughs>